Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Nielsen Library. Uh, I'm Susan Fliss, Dean of Libraries, and I am just thrilled to be able to welcome you to this wonderful talk uh, by Professor of Theater Kiki Smith, class of 71. Uh, and the talk is Beyond the Scenes, Noticing Lives in the Details of Old Clothes. We're grateful to the Friends of the Library's Oculus Society for sponsoring this event and to Historic Northampton also for partnering with us. For those who are here in person, we invite you to a reception afterwards uh, right across the hall in the Conway Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And for um, as also just a reminder, if people could silence your phones if you haven't already, thank you. And for our online audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will, um, we will have time at the end for questions and answers. So for today, um, we're happy to have Lynn Bassett with us to introduce Kiki. Lynn is a clothing and textile curator who focuses on how fashion manifests social, political, economic, and religious movements in tandem with the other decorative and fine arts. She has served as a curatorial consultant with collections here at Smith, at Historic Northampton, Wadsworth Athenaeum, and several other museum and private collections. So, Lynn? Uh, thank you. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce Kiki Smith this afternoon, though I find it hard to believe that she needs introducing. Kiki has been a theater teacher here for, she told me, I don't know if I can tell you, this is her 50th year. And her credentials are extensive and impressive. But let's focus on Kiki, the person, rather than the professor. I'm quite sure she's one of the most beloved people on campus. For myself, I call her my beloved boss, Kiki. I have worked for Kiki for the past 10 years as a consultant on the historic costume collection, and she is seriously the kindest and most empathetic person I know, and brilliant. That combination of empathy and brilliance has led her to develop one of the most unique and important historic clothing collections in the United States. I've been working as a curator of historic fashion and textiles for 40 years, and I can tell you that no one, no one, has created a collection that expresses the story of real women across the economic and eth ethnic spectrum, like Kiki has gathered and curated in the Mendenhall Center's basement. Kiki has taught me to appreciate the lives represented by worn out sleeve cuffs, the shadow left by an apron where it protected the dress fabric from sunlight, and the tears at the arms I see, which is this scene, caused by outstretched arms picking up heavy loads. And now I am delighted to turn it over to Kiki so she can teach you too. Well, greetings. It's a real treat and an honor to be uh, speaking here in one of my favorite places, the library, um, and also on behalf of another favorite place, historic Northampton, um, and to be talking about things that I really love. So what's not to like, you know? Uh, I, and I, uh, I have copies of my book available over there, and we'll talk about that at the end. But in any case, I am a convert to the world of historic dress. As a costume designer, I've known how important real garments are as sources of information that can feed my designs. They can tell me about construction techniques, about colors and textures of other eras, about etiquette and rules of behavior that I've never had to consider and that I never even knew existed. And the information is rich and varied and deep and endless. <laughs> Each piece can reveal another detail and suggest another story. It is delicious. If you have a colleague like Lynn Bassett to teach you to recognize important details, you can find ever more connections with the social, political, and economic events of the time. 
And it's wonderful to have, of course, online access to very fine, rich collections of major museums, especially for examples of couture and the clothing of the upper classes. Now, I use those images in classes and for many of the plays that I design, but these collections don't help me find examples of the clothes worn by maids and housewives. I can find some images in photographs in collections such as the Library of Congress or an old Sears and Roebuck catalog, but I want tangible contact with clothing that belong to women of other races and other social classes. I'm drawn to the clothes of the ordinary, often forgotten women. And that's now a strength of the collection here at Smith. The collection is small compared to the collections in large museum. We have just about 4,000 pieces. Historic Northampton has at least 10, but who's counting? Um, yet even at that size, I'm told by people I respect that it's a valuable resource and it may well influence the direction of clothing history studies and other clothing collections while providing material culture important for all kinds of research. These collections offer pedagogical and research opportunities that have usually been ignored, mostly because they represent the ordinary, the common person, and a lot because most people have never had the chance to learn to read them, to connect them with events and inventions and social upheavals, work patterns, and more. Now at Smith, it's been the Smith students who helped this collection survive and flourish. We're all hooked by the tangible connections to women of other eras, to those hands that could sculpt complex forms and those hands that patched and mended. Inevitably, questions arise. Why? Why do the clothes look like this? Who? Who wore them and why? And what? What could be their significance? Now, these are all important questions not usually asked of old clothes. And it's the students who, from the beginning, recognized the value of the whole collection. It was one who started the collection in 1979. Beth set up the structure and the systems we still use today, down in the basement of the theater building, down on Green Street. So, um, well, those are not quite examples of clothing, but they give you an idea of the shapes of different women. Here we are in the basement. And a few samples of these ordinary, ugly, 50-plus metal cabinets and the, some hanging garments in one of them. Can you see how crowded they are? Oosh. So, But faculty members from a variety of departments have brought students to see some of the pieces that connect with their courses. For instance, a French department professor has twice taught, brought his intermediate class in his course Consumers, Culture, and the French Department Store. The class was halfway through reading Zola's novel in French, of course, Au Bonheur des Dames. I read it as The Ladies' Paradise, about the lives of all of those working and shopping in one of the first large Parisian department stores, a consumer's paradise. Zola researched the stores at the time, and he based the story on Au Bon Marché, which is still there, still in Paris. In the late 60s, the store had expanded from a fabric store to incorporating ready-to-wear clothing, house furnishes, and even rest lounges. But textiles were still the heart of the, of the machine of the store. I found mention of at least 25 types of silk fabrics 15 cottons and wools, and all kinds of specific clothing terms. And I assume most of those would be lost on a 21st century audience. So I showed students examples of these silks, some already made up into ensembles, undergarments, cloaks, shoes, plus laces, like this Chantilly lace shawl that you see there in the background. They saw the underproppers, as they can be euphemistically called, the cage crinolines that were made by 
poor women in early factories, as you can see on the left, um, and, and the students had to rethink how all these artificially expanded women negotiated the crowds in the stores, however grand the spaces were. And to consider um, how the sales clerks likely were dressed compared to the store's wealthy clients. They're not in the bright yellow silks. They're in plain white collars with a good black dress or as good as she could afford and maintain, likely wool or wool and silk. So over 40 years ago, the since then, the collection has grown and developed. More faculty and students find it and use it. And I'm teaching a course each year called Reading Dress, Archival Studies of Clothing. So up to 24 students start, learn significant details about clothing, and they study a selected group of garments from the collection and a concentration which they'll exhibit at the end of the semester. In fact, you two would certainly know this because um, they do videos now thanks to their help. Um, so one year we studied women's suits between 1905 and 1970. Another year we looked at cotton and cotton clothes and the rather ugly heritage of that fabric. Um, just last year, this past fall, we looked at linen garments. But since September, a lot more people now know about this collection, thanks to some fortuitous connections and plucky, determined friends and women. This book, Real Clothes, Real Lives, 200 Years of What Women Wore, was published last September. It is filled with photographs of many of our ordinary clothes and accessories. So here's how I organized the book. This is thanks with also a lot of input from great, very wise consultants, including Lynn. Um, I divided chosen pieces into chapters based around groups of clothes. So they're clothes that were only worn at home. I wear my sweats, women wear other things, not worn in public. Then there are the clothes worn in public, clothes that mark life transitions, all kinds of accessories, suits, and clothes that women have worn when rebelling against traditional styles. These are, as one student so brilliantly pointed out, social uniforms, the clothes we all wear for our jobs and activities we do all day. We are wearing them now. I have on the uniform I wear for professional work here at Smith, and you're likely wearing uh, a uniform too. But let me show you a few examples from the book um, but it's a struggle. I only picked out 11, um, and it's like choosing a favorite child. I also should tell you that the reason these clothes look so beautiful uh, is thanks to Lynn. She is the headdresser for these things. So this is a lovely printed cotton dress, and it's an example from the chapter on public dress. It is a good dress, hand sewn, in about 1830 to be worn for day wear, whether to church or family gatherings. It came as part of a very large bequest from a Smith alum, so I don't know who wore it or even where it came from, but I do know that it would have been worn by a middle-class woman and someone who was aware of the fashionable cut of dresses at the time. In this case, those huge ballooning sleeves that droop off her upper arm and making a long sloping shoulder line, a tiny waist, again, accented by a full ballooning skirt over multiple petticoats. Here's a French fashion plate from about the same time. Now this is showing a dress made of expensive silk and fine lace, but basically it's the same style. Middle and upper class women all over this country would keep up to date with the fashion images and changes reported from abroad in monthly periodicals, such as Godey's Ladies Book. Within months, their dresses could be tweaked and tucked to reflect the newest styles from Paris. So even this country girl is in a stylish dress to receive her gentleman caller. Her hem floats a few inches above the ground, revealing her shoes and her very clean white stockings. 
This is a painting by William Sidney Mount, who painted many domestic scenes of rural country folk like this. Now there are old seam holes around the bodice waistline that indicate that this woman probably altered the dress around 1835. She probably undid that gathered skirt to drop it down just a few inches from where it was. She was following the shift from a very high waist to one dropping further down. And from some other telltale sewing seams, she apparently lifted the sleeves up on the arm just a tad. She had invested enough in the fabric and at the time it took to make the dress to warrant that she wanted to update it. Here's a portrait of a woman from Springfield, Massachusetts down the road. Now she's dressed in her version of a good dress and this is made from plaid silk. Her waistline sits at the same level as our dress. It's the same shoulder line and the same shaped sleeve. Now you've probably noticed that diaphanous folded white shawl over the sloping shoulders. This one is a square of very sheer cotton folded on the diagonal with white on white embroidery all around the edge and especially at those points. Fine stitching like this would have been taught to middle class girls as part of their education. Sometimes I threaten the students here saying you could be doing this instead of being here. Uh, the dress is a, also a fine example of the fast development of cotton manufacturing in the Industrial Revolution, especially in the first half of the 19th century. Thanks to the development of machines that could gin the cotton to remove the small seeds, spin and weave it, and then print it in popular colors and patterns, it became the most plentiful material available. Cheaper, too mostly because of the enslaved people growing and harvesting the cotton bowls and the low paid women working in the textile mills up in the north. The south had the open land and the forced labor for the agricultural side. The north had hilly and rocky land, which was not good for agriculture, but it had plenty of fast flowing rivers fast enough to power the early mills. I love the complexity of this pattern and the lush range of colors. Each of the five colors was printed separately using either carved wooden blocks or metal cylinders embossed with that color's place in the pattern. Then the fabric was washed, pressed, and spread for the next color printing. So this cut, one cotton, likely made in a run of about 27 yards, required at least five separate pressings. So this fabric would have been more costly than the woman's labor to make it. Now, not all printed cottons had this many colors. Many of the cheapest and those found in the private world were just two colors, like this one. By the time of this house dress, homemade about 1860, the cost of printed cotton was low enough that the poorer classes could afford to have more than one set of clothing. And since they were washable, the hygiene of that level of the population improved and the spread of some diseases dropped. Now this is definitely not an example of high fashion, although the round high neckline and the full skirt worn of course over at least one petticoat were typical of the day. This one is faded and worn. So what's its value? What can it tell us? The pattern of the small white leaves and the little white dots on a black ground was a print often called a mourning print, as in grieving, signifying some stage of mourning. So maybe this woman was a widow, or maybe she was just using a practical print for, her, for all her hard labor. Whoever she was, she had work to do. If you look at her sleeves, these are loose on the arm, as was the style, but these don't gather into a tight cuff at the wrist. These sleeves are meant to be pushed up the arm, out of the way, likely to keep them out of the wash tub or out of a mixing bowl. Now, there are no visible closures down the bodice's center front, just to hook an eye inside the waistband and little holes at the neckline where she wore a pin, probably similar to this one. The bodice is shaped and held together by what's inside.
uh, open the front and you'll find out how. Under the front of the bodice, there's a whole separate inner bodice that does close with hooks and eyes. You can see, I think, a row of the hooks, or maybe they're the eyes down one side there. But these inner front panels and the inside of the bodice's back are made from a different printed cotton. It's a block cotton on white that looks quite white when you see it from the back side in this case. But look at the side panel there, one of those panels. You can see that that is yet another piece of a printed calico. Is there a message here? Now, an old worn dress was useful to the end. And when taken apart, the original bodice could serve as a pattern and a lining for a newer fabric. So that might explain the lighter calico lining from another dress. But then as the wearer aged or perhaps had several pregnancies, her girth might have expanded. So if she eased open the side seams, loosened some of the gathering of the skirt, she could insert a new side panel from a saved scrap of the outside material and line it with a different calico. Here's a, ver a young woman proudly showing the shuttles of cotton threads like those she used in a cotton mill somewhere in New England. Notice the dark fabric with a small print and how she's pushed her sleeves all the way up her arm. Might notice too that her hair is cut short, possibly to keep it out of the way of the machines, but also apparently she may have suffered a high fever and they would cut the woman's hair to cool her down. Most of the cotton woven over the century was made by hundreds of underpaid women like this, mostly young women coming from small family farms, all seeking a paying job that could help sustain their families back home and maybe even save a little bit for their later marriage. The work conditions in the mills were appalling, noisy, air full of cotton lint, fast moving parts that could easily catch a skirt or long hair. Um, something is interrupting here. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know quite why it's not proceeding. Jeff, do you have any idea why I can't, yes. I can't move the slide? No. There's a little blip that says talking in the corner. Nielsen 102 browsing room. So that's what I should be changing. Sorry. Huh? Magic, thank you. So this is a daguerreotype of an anonymous woman who, according to the label, was thought to be a washerwoman for the Union Army. Notice her rolled up sleeves and the small white print on a dark ground, as well, of course, as the little flag pinned to her dress. This is easy to wash and wear. Now, Meet an assembly of gar garments also made of two color printed cottons. These are called wrappers, they're house dresses. These, all these five are from about 1895 and these are worn only at home and only in private. And so gently fitted that by the end of the century, they could be manufactured cheaply in factories, part of the rise of the ready-made clothing industry at least two of these could have been purchased from a Sears or Montgomery Ward catalog, which were widely distributed to all parts of the country. Now women living on remote farms in Vermont or Iowa could order an inexpensive version of a wrapper. This one must have been made by a skilled dressmaker. The small mother of pearl buttons and the hand-stitched buttonholes are so delicate they can make me weep. Look at those perfect gauge pleats or gathers across the bust, all held in place by fine hand stitches. Why have I saved five examples of one garment 
all from the same year. Why not save just this one, the best made, and let all the others go? I'd save space. But this Smith collection is a teaching archive, not a museum that might value only the finest examples. One of my mentors, Nancy Rexford, taught me that when learning to recognize features of a style, it is helpful, if not essential, to see more than one example. So anyone beginning to study historic dress and styles can study all five and notice clues regarding different social class, variations of construction and kinds of wear. They can notice the language and the grammar of this garment. Multiples of one style have much to say to us, if not more than one example of the highest style worn in Paris in 1895. Like the black house dress, these garments also have inner bodices closed with hooks and eyes or buttons and made of a plainer muslin and fitting snugly around the torso using darts and curved seams. Now these inner bodices might be left loose in the later months of pregnancy, since most women tried to stay out of the public eye when showing if this would have been a comfortable house dress. It was also useful for women who were ill and bedridden and receiving close friends in her bedroom. Well, here's one exception to that rule. I can assume this woman was not pleased to be called out of the house for the family photograph and perhaps not pleased either with the prospect of another toe-headed baby. Now here's a smaller collection of just three white blouses, also dear to my heart. These were called shirtwaists, and they were considered feminine versions of a man's shirt of the time. They closed down the center front with either buttons or metal studs. They have high standing collars and finished button cuffs. Now these three are from between 1895 and 1910. Like their fathers and their brothers' shirts, women wore them with heavily starched separate collars attached with small metal studs. Then they could add dark ribbon ties or wide silky stocks like the woman here on the right. These graceful young women were students at Atlanta University in about 1897. And they wore theirs with skirts and probably they might have had a matching jacket to the, for a suit that had become the uniform for working women and college students. So these blouses are examples of some early challenges to traditional women's dress. They were quickly adopted by women of all classes who found them less confining than boned bodices, easy to launder, inexpensive, and good for their jobs. So these waists, along with petticoats and chemises and skirts were made in the hundreds if not thousands in small factories, usually on upper floors of city walk-ups and employing mostly young immigrant women. I suspect you've heard of the tragic Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City in 1911, when over 100 women, immigrant women working in this factory died and they were unable to escape the up upper floors. So perhaps the very same women who died were wearing shirtwaists too. This is Blanche Ames in her first year here at Smith in about 1895. In her shirt waist and her bow tie and her boater hat, which is a lot like what she, her brother might have worn, she is an example of the so-called new woman, young women recognized by none other than Henry James as independent, educated, early feminists and cyclists. Coincidentally, when the two-wheeled bicycle with rubber tires became widely available in the 1890s, they were ideal for young women to travel independently, whether to work or on an unchaperoned outing with friends. Now, a mother, another major force in the change of women's clothing was World War I. Now, countries go to war, women often adopt some details of the uniform styles worn by the soldiers. So here on the right is actually an example of a store-bought suit from 1917 when the US entered the war. 
made with the same big four pockets with button flaps and in dark army green as some of the men's uniforms. I've seen this style in 1917 department store catalogs. This suit actually has a label, Abercrombie and Fitch, which had originally only sold sporting clothes for men, but by this time they were selling some garments for women too. And what about the shortened skirt? May be hard to tell here, but they've gone up. Once the US entered the war, many women took over men's work and clothes had to be more accommodating to all kinds of labor. Long skirts had to go. This particular suit on the right belonged to a Smith graduate from 1909, who was known as Pidge Carr. That year, 1917, she joined the newly formed Smith College Relief Unit. 19 Smith alums who went to Northern France near the trenches and the battles to bring humanitarian relief. This is a group photograph. Here's a photograph of a couple of them passing out medical supplies in Paris. They set up their base in a little village called Grecourt that had been recently rampaged and left by the German army. Pidge, who wore this armband, was one of two drivers helping to deliver supplies. All of them helped to feed the refugees and care for the wounded soldiers as well as restore the schools. In 1924, the college erected copies of the iron gates outside the ruined Greycourt Chateau. These Greycourt gates in front of College Hall were recognition of this, these women's remarkable work. Now, the garment on the left is an official uniform distributed by the US Army for hundreds of women volunteering here in this country for the Motor Corps of America, providing ambulance services for soldiers who were coming back from the war. And you can see the parallels between this official uniform and the suit worn by Pidge, including the cut of the jacket and the buttons down the center front of the skirt and a belt, one of them being leather and the other being the matching wool. This particular uniform belonged to Margaret Claddock Elkman, who was a physics major who graduated from Smith in 1916 before enlisting. Perhaps she was inspired by this recruiting poster, or she saw other women like these in uniform. Her grandson, who gave us the uniform, recalled that she was always proud of her auto mechanical skills. She learned in the war and she happily dove under a car hood late into her later years. All right, this is one of a pair of homemade dresses from a seller in Chillicothe, Ohio. This dress is from about 1938 in the depths of the Great Depression. And Chillicothe is deep in coal country. This dress is skimpy, made of cheap printed cotton with plastic buttons and a simple trim around the collar and down the front. Now look at this dress of a woman in North Carolina in a 1939 photograph by the famous Dorothea Lange, who noticed in her title that the dress and the apron, can you see the apron? You can see the bib slightly. They were homemade and it's almost a duplicate of ours. Now, close up, I'm not sure you can see it so well, you may be able to notice that along the back side, it's very faded, except for a narrow strip around her waist. It also is not so faded down the center front, it is faded down the sleeves. Of course, she was wearing her apron all day, and that covered her front, and around her waist. Now this dress is beyond well worn. Can you see that the collar is worn through and the edges of the cuffs are frayed and tearing and even the buttons have faded from what was originally red. Now inside, you can see another example of making use of every scrap. The back of the bodice is reinforced with another very faded piece of printed cotton, probably part of another dress taken apart to help make this one. Why were these saved? And why weren't they cut up into rags or pitched out years ago? Maybe a favorite granddaughter saved them 
as one of the few remnants of her grandmother's life. Or maybe they were just stuffed in a rag bag in a closet. However they were saved, they are rare and valuable links to connect us with this woman's difficult life. Imagine studying this dress while reading The Grapes of Wrath. Only a few years later, during World War II, a girl in Wellesley, Massachusetts wore this Girl Scout uniform. Now, and you can see other Girl Scouts in the adjoining uh, image. There are clues that this uniform was made during World War II because it follows the recommended rationing regulations from the government. The War Protection Board, see that, WPB, issued guides to save fabric for the troops. So the maximum length of a dress was not to exceed 45 inches. The skirt comes just below the knee. It's very trim and smooth at the waist and only slightly flared. This uniform also closes with buttons, not a zipper like the uniforms from the 1930s. This is a result of the push to save all metal for the troops. <laughs> Look at her sleeve where the scouts wore their badges. And you can see she was a lot more motivated than I ever was. <laughs> there are 20 badges. And it might interest you to know that this dress belonged to the poet Sylvia Plath. When Karen Kukiel, who was in the rare book collection and did a lot of study of Sylvia Plath's works uh, and letters, when she saw this dress, and the armful of badges, her comment was, yep, she certainly was a type A personality. <laughs> now here's another kind of uniform, important, I believe, to save. These are a range of waitress uniforms from the 1930s into the 1980s. They're based on the styles of domestic workers and nurses' uniforms. They're to all jobs available for women immigrants, persons of color, and except for the nurses, require little education. These clothes are made for physical and often dirty work. What do they have in common? Pockets, of course. And they're washable. And the cotton ones on the left can open all the way down, making them easier to spread on an ironing board and press. By the mid-50s, we can see the introduction of synthetic fabrics. That pink one in the background there is proudly wears a Dacron polyester little tag. Might be easy to wash, but as you probably know, they're hot to wear. But all of these are trim and pretty easy to move in. This is Geneva Tisdale in 1993 at her retirement as a waitress, celebrated by none other than Jesse Jackson. Tisdale, still in her uniform, worked for 42 years at a lunch counter at the Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina. That lunch counter was the site of the first sit-down profit test of the store's policy denying counter service to blacks. On February 1st, 1960, four black students from the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College sat down were never served and left only when the store closed. For weeks, other black students continued the protest. News of the strike spread nationally and there were other protests. Finally, six months later at the end of July, the store manager relented, but he insisted that the first blacks to be served at that counter were the three black employees in the store, including Ms. Tisdale. So here's a final favorite. Many of you will recall the icon of the 1960s English mod style, Mary Quant, with her mini skirts and her bright tights and her vinyl shoes and her angular Vidal Sassoon short bob. She was the it girl of this time. She had a small boutique selling upscale outfits in London. And in fact, our colleague Helen Searing brought a number of those which she passed along. Those are the high-end ones, but her real business was selling her designs through J.C. Penney here in the States. This is a wool jumper sold at J.C. Penney in the late 60s, so very short, bold, and mod. There's the label, designed for pennies by Mary Quant, made in England. And here's a page from a 1968 
Penny's catalog is showing a similar jumper with the young London look designed exclusively for Penny's. When I was writing this book, I saw the terrific documentary, Summer of Soul, it was over at Amherst Cinema. And it's about a series of free concerts held in Harlem the summer of 1969. Now this is my favorite music and it was really hard to sit still. And when Gladys Knight and her pip started singing, I heard it through the grapevine, I was in heaven. Then I saw what she was wearing. This is a velveteen version of the same mod style Mary Quant jumper. Now I suspect Gladys's versions did not come from the J.C. Penney catalog, but nonetheless, here's a terrific example of the fast spread of high fashion, fashion now determined by the youth. It's a whole new generation, baby, and it's an example of the influence of women designers. So there are many more favorites in the collection, and now the book to share with you, but I'll leave that for you to discover. I hope you're convinced of the power of clothes, all clothes, not just high fashion ones, to hold stories and to offer insights into nearly forgotten ways of life. Well, is this the conclusion of a project or is there a next step? It's, uh, isn't it time to take some of these clothes out of the basement and into the world? Well, actually in September, there will be um, an exhibit of many pieces from the book at the New York Historical Society and Museum in New York. Uh, but that's only a beginning. So these are scraps of the 99% of women, often the only physical remainders of their lives. And even garments from anonymous women hold connections to lives that are usually hard to understand. I love these tangible pieces. And I also feel like collections like this ought to be accessible for research and used for teaching by more than just a few here. I hope we can get this collection into premises that are best for their long-term survival and open to the world for, to see and study. There's a space archeologist, Sarah Parsak, whom I heard on a TED talk. She uses satellite images of far up looking at deserts and at um, jungles. And she hires people just to scan these images looking for little blips in the sand or little peculiarities in the jungle for ancient burial sites. She notes that these hidden sites can reveal vast amounts of information about the perspectives of previous civilizations. She feels that we take for granted what we know about the past and that we don't recognize that most of our history is still hidden. As she says, there's much more to be found about human relationships and clues about our collective resilience and creativity. She believes that as I do, that the past is worth finding and saving. Materials, whether ancient temples or a handmade pair of shoes expand the story of our human journey. And as she says, if we acknowledge that the past is worth saving, it means that we are worth saving too. Thank you very much. Thanks. I am preaching to the converted in a lot of ways here, I, I admit, so. Questions? Mr. Oram, please. Just wonder, just wonder. Um, oh, there's a, a microphone for you. Because, thank you. Two questions. Um, one is, uh, when they were looking abroad, uh, you were talking about that in relation to a 19th century dress for fashion. Was this France or England, or was it oh, both? Both. It was oh. A lot of French, but mostly, I, I would say, a good majority of them would be um, English. Uh -huh. And <laughs> Lynn, please. It, 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 okay. In the early 19th century, the French 
we're actually looking at um, the English and looking at sort of that casual country style. So that was a major influence, but Paris was still like the center for Western fashion as it had been since the 17th century. Question number two. Question number two is, um, you mentioned just offhand um, women designers. Um, is there a shift between everything designed by men or is it women from early on? Who does the, desi who does the designing? That depends on the era. And you know, there many of the clothes um, before the ready to wear industry really generated a lot of garments would be made at home or made by a dressmaker. And if they're made by a dressmaker or even if they're made at home, you know, a woman maybe and her daughters would go shopping to get the fabric there and go to another store to get the buttons and another store to get the trims um, and bring them together, either bring them home where they were either making them by hand or had a sewing machine or taking them to a dressmaker. Um, and there were patterns being distributed in some of these same magazines that were available. The Demarest patterns is the back, I think that's the base of the Butterick pattern, it's actually. Two. Yeah, and Demarest. So they could find actual patterns to read, and let me tell you, they're complicated. They're all the patterns piled on top of each other, the pieces, so you've really got to know what you're looking at. Um, but, um, you know, the men get the first recognition of couture, like um, um, uh, Worth, Charles Worth, who was English but developed his business there. Uh, but by the turn of the century, there were beginning to be women who, particularly in Paris, were making exquisite pieces that um, the well-to-do would go to get their measurements, make their orders of their dresses, and then continue on the grand tour, come back through Paris, pick them up and take them home. So certainly by the twenties, you know, there are a number of them. Is that pretty much rounded up? Wow, women designing clothes for women. What a concept. <laughs> um, I was curious, I know like society, especially trends with clothing, like race doesn't necessarily come into play because what's popular is popular. But I guess um, I bought your book. I haven't read it yet. Um, but do you find any like fashion trends among like different races or like immigrants that were like different than maybe, I guess, the majority? That would be pretty hard to track. I have, a, there is one book um, I know about uh, immigrant Jewish women arriving at the turn at the beginning of the 20th century. And the first generation would cling to many of the clothes that they were familiar with. But even then they would be encouraged by their families to take, um, to begin to change, to take on a, a version of what was seen as the styles. And many of them would be living in cities, so they'd be well aware of what was available in stores, even if they couldn't afford them. And I suspect um, it would be the same for people of color living in this country. They could be very, and you know, like that wonderful daguerreotype of the washerwoman in the Union Army. I mean, that's the same dress just about. So uh, I'm sure there were increments of difference. I suspect more in the accessories, the way the hair is treated. A lot of that is religiously based or culturally based. So some things they would keep, I would suspect. That's a general answer. Yes, Elisa. This is great, Kiki. Um, and I had the privilege of seeing the collections and working with you for so many years. But you asked why 
and how did they save things? And I'm thinking about now, you know, we live in this culture where there's a new trend every five minutes. We're always getting new things and sending the old things off. The things we do save, I think, are children's clo baby clothes. And sometimes they go on to other relatives and on to generation. I mean, I have baby clothes. I have my mother's baby clothes. So, and the other thing is women's clothing seems to be saved more than men's. Do you, did you find that? I mean, I know you're not working with men's clothing, but thinking about who's actually doing the saving. Yeah. 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 And maybe the men don't invest the same kind of mm, sentiment. sen sentimentality about a garment and yeah. what they remember it for. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly children's stuff. But then I think it's, um, it is a rude awakening when you find that your child has no interest in all that cool stuff How true. that you saved just for them. In all your years of research, have you come up with any relevatory information about how women dealt with menstruation with their clothing? That's becoming more and more information that's more and more available. Certainly, 25 years ago, it wasn't. Um, I did have a student tell me with great authority that that's why there's so many red petticoats, so that their blood wouldn't show. And I'm thinking, I don't think we have a single red petticoat downstairs at all. Really, where'd you find that out? Um, so, and actually we were, I was thinking, uh, that came up recently um, about, you know, were there sponges? Were there, when cloth was so um, valuable, were there rags to use that way, to wash and to use? Um, so I'm sure that there's, information available, but it is, it's not a verboten subject anymore to, to be brought to the surface. Yeah. Anybody else? Michelle. What percentage of the Smith collection garments were homemade or handmade versus purchased? I'd say a majority of them are manufactured uh, because it, the sewing machine was developed in about 1856. It became available, beginning to get made available, uh, and it was marketed to have every woman want one in her parlor. Um, but uh, it, the ready-to-wear industry has really kind of taken over. And it certainly was beginning to do that by the beginning of the 1900s. So most of the clothes that we have um, are manufactured, I would say. I don't know a percentage, that I can't give that, but I sense. What would it cost a middle-class woman to buy ready-made dresses or suits? Was it significantly cheaper to make their own? Uh, at what particular era. Um, and it depends on the quality, of course. I mean, they could order their suits from Sears and Roebuck. And it, they, they, prices look pretty good to us, but you know, if you translate them, there's still a hefty investment. And you could still find a dressmaker to make them. That would be a more expensive variation though. So you're paying for the cheaper labor and probably less quality cloth and not quite such fine work. Although it uh, amazes me to look inside some of the pieces that we have, uh, the suits, uh, the suits that were clearly from about 1912 that were clearly bought in a, in a store or from a catalog. And yet there's hand stitching all around the shoulder seams and hand stitching to get the collar to lie, lie right. And, and a lot of machine stitching. So it, even the store-bought ones would have had a mixture of it. I'm not sure that's, I think I've gotten off the question, but uh, hopefully enough of it. 
What underpinning would a woman wear with a shirtwaist, if not a corset? Oh, she would wear that. But first she would wear a chemise, which is by this time usually a cotton little slip. Um, so it's easily washable and worn against the skin. And then over that would come the corset. And then the various petticoats. Most women would wear at least two, if not three, petticoats. Um, and then over that would be the corset cover, which is to keep the corset clean. And then you put on your shirtwaist. No sheer clothes here. Okay, there's one more. You know, do one more. Yeah, you've been very patient. Roxy? Well, you may have just answered my question, but I was wondering with all the layers that they wore, but I, I'm wondering about warmth and learning that sheep weren't here yet in the early 1700s. I, I think the she, well, well, was it wool that they were? Well, wearing? of course, the colonists here were importing fabric. They were not encouraged to make their own. They were a market for the manufacturers back in England. So there was a shipment of wools, beautiful okay. wools, of course, and the linens um, coming here. Okay. And it wasn't until later, I think, that Merino wool were... wasn't around until well, um, until early early 19th century. Yeah, okay. I mean, the hills of New England are good for raising sheep. Yeah. Not, not for a lot of crops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, this could I want more and then feel free to come up after. I was just curious about the hems of those long skirts. How did they keep protect them? Did they have a special lining on the inside or? Um, there is a wonderful wool braid. It's about that wide that is uh, basted on right around the bottom edge of a lot of women's skirts. Um, and so that's removable and it saves the fabric. Um, and particularly in the first half of the 19th century, the skirts were made so that there was no hem. It was just the straight panel or very little hem because it was valuable, this fabric. You wouldn't waste a lot turning it under. So boy, you really had to have a little braid around the bottom, which could also add a little fullness to the skirt and make it look prettier. Great, so thank you so much. Thank you, Kiki. Uh, and I know that there are more questions. Uh, and so please uh, join us across the hall for some refreshments and Kiki, you'll join us as well. Yeah, thank you.